Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Tonight's program, presented jointly by the International Spy Museum and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, is entitled Cold War Tech, Spies, Cameras, and Incredible Images. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank all our members and donors for their support. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library and the International Spy Museum share strong educational missions. The International Spy Museum's mission is to educate the public about espionage and intelligence in an engaging way and to provide a context for understanding the important role intelligence has played in history and continues to play today. We are committed to the apolitical presentation of espionage in order to provide visitors with impartial, accurate information. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library is a nonpartisan, non-government information center supported by its members and sponsors. Our mission is to increase the public's understanding of military history and national security affairs, as well as how military service and the sacrifices made by the men and women who have worn the uniform have shaped our country's democracy. In this webinar format, you are invited to post relevant questions or comments in the Q&A feed, and we'll do our best to address them. This program is being recorded and will be available for streaming on our website and the Spy Museum YouTube channel. I am Dr. Matthew S. Muehlbauer. Chief Military Historian of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome our two panelists, John Mendez and Dr. Andrew Hammond. John Mendez is a founding advisory member, finding advisory board member of the International Spy Museum, a former chief of disguise in the CIA's Office of Technical Service. Ms. Mendez was also a specialist in clandestine photography. Her 27-year career, for which she earned the CIA's Intelligence Commendation Medal included operational disguise responsibilities in the most hostile theaters of the Cold War, from Havana to Beijing to Moscow, and ultimately into the Oval Office. She is currently an author, lecturer, teacher, and consultant on intelligence matters. She has co-written several books with her late husband, Antonio Mendez, including Spy Dust, Argo, and most recently, The Moscow Rules. Dr. Andrew Hammond is historian and curator at the International Spy Museum, specializing in military and intelligence history and host of its podcast, SpyCast. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Struggles for Freedom, Afghanistan and U.S. Foreign Policy Since 1979, and is working on another book that tells the story of 9-11 and the post-9-11 wars through the voices of intelligence and mili military and intelligence veterans, pardon me. He has taught at a number of institutions on both sides of the Atlantic and has held fellowships at the British Library, Library of Congress, New York University, and the University of Warwick. He was formerly a Mellon Public Humanities Fellow at the 9-11 Memorial Museum and is currently a Public Policy Fellow at the Wilson Center. Now, in a few moments, I'll turn over the discussion, Dr. Hammond and then John Mendez, for their presentations on Cold War photographic intelligence. Dr. Hammond will focus a little more on the technology, while Ms. Mendez will give a little more information on the human side of employment technology. I'll then follow up with a few questions and dialogue among us before opening up the discuss discussion to questions from the audience. Before I turn over the conversation, however, I'll just offer a few comments for historical context. Now, while photography was first invented in the 19th century, it was the first world war that definitively demonstrated its utility for intelligence, and particularly photographs obtained by aerial observation. The earliest mission of the belligerent air forces, even prior to combat air patrols and bombing, was reconnaissance. Now, we should have a, stere a stereographic image here from the collections of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. And this, yes, these, this is a, um, you're seeing an image of a French Samson A2A aircraft. And this is one of the two models used for, to, for the reconnaissance role in the French Air Force at the time. Now, aerial phot photographs quickly proved their work for providing intelligence on ent enemy dispositions, defenses, infrastructure on the ground, especially how, give, how trench fortifications dominated tactical movement on the Western Front in World War I. Now, as examples, right now you should be taking, uh, seeing photos taken by German aerial intelligence, also held in the collections of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Now, you'll note these have information, usually in the top of the image, indicating date and time taken, location, coordinates, et cetera. And some of them also have markings indicating, uh, in indicating positions of, of intelligence significance. For example, this one. Um, you see, hopefully you can see some red dots and maybe we'll blow in there to see them. The on the back of this photograph, written in German, are noticing that these red dots indicate possible mortar positions, which I think is fascinating. And we have another one here um, 
This one, I'm not sure if you can see that. Maybe we can blow it up a little bit. Um, that word it apparently is maskierung, which is German, and it can mean disguise or disguise. So that word and that, and that position might be a, a possible concealed position. So these are examples of some actual intelligence products created from the first aerial reconnaissance photography. But from a broader standpoint, what's fascinating about the World War I experience is both the pace of technological development as well as the creation of the first systems to produce, analyze, and disseminate photographic intelligence. Now, the best book to explore these points, at least from the Allied side, is Terence J. Finnegan's Shooting the Front, Allied Air Reconnaissance in the First World War. Um, and yes, you're seeing it there, awesome. Now, Finnegan highlights a whole host of issues surrounding the development and use of cameras for intelligence purposes, especially for inter aerial intelligence purposes. How do you install one in a plane in a way that the images are not blurred by the propeller's rotation? What is the best way to approach the targeted area? What type of image does the operator take? At what angle and what type of exposure? But beyond the creation and employment of specific technologies, what is intriguing are the systems and organizations constructed around early reconnaissance. Uh, for example, <clears throat> the establishment of photographic sections of, of military aviation and intelligence branches, schools to teach photographic interpretation, and processes to manufacture battlefield maps from earlier photos for ground commanders. Um, as an example of the personnel needs that all these organizations require, here we have a recruiting poster for, from the Pritzker Museum Collections for U.S. Naval and Aviation. And that plane, um, no, not an aviation expert, that plane is probably more of an observation or reconnaissance airplane. Now, the construction of articulated robust systems for the generation of aerial photographic intelligence reoccurred in World War II. Now, many people have heard of Bletchley Park the Center for Allied Code-Breaking Efforts Against Germany during the conflict. Now for aerial photographic intelligence, the equivalent organization was the RA facility at Medmenum. And I realize I may be mispronouncing that. And Dr. Hammond, fee, please feel free to correct me in a moment if I am. Um, and as Taylor Downing has noted in his book, Spies in the Sky, The Secret Battle for Intelligence in World War II, the staff at Medmenum was quite diverse. Throughout his existence, about a quarter of all photographic interpreters of the organization were women who performed outstanding service. In short, by the time of the Cold War, governments had experience developing systems to acquire, produce, and disseminate photographic intelligence. Now, of course, the particular technologies available to intelligence professionals and how they're employed, including the risks as well, have changed over time. And now for more on these issues with respect to the early Cold War, I'll turn to Dr. Hammond and then he will be uh, followed by John Amendus. Dr. Hammond. Thank you very much. Could you start my PowerPoint presentation, please, Hannah? Thank you. Uh, okay, so. I'm going to talk just for 10 minutes about imagery intelligence. Now, I'm going to talk mainly about the Cold War, but I'm going to put it in a broader narrative arc of technological development. So just very briefly about my background, I spent a number of years in the Royal Air Force. And one of the places that I was, uh, that I served was a photographic intelligence unit in Germany. Um, and that was, they played quite an important role during the Cold War. And as you can imagine, being a, serving after the post-Cold, after the Cold War, I heard lots of the, the war stories from the Cold War warriors, but it was really, really interesting to be there. Um, I was trained in uh, ground photography, aerial photography, we started off with um, film and then moved on to digital. So, so the visual component of intelligence has always been fascinating to me. So if we think of signals, and I'm simplifying here, if signals are the ears and measurements and signals and, intelli and signature intelligence is the taste and the touch, getting chemical compositions, x-rays and so forth, then imagery intelligence is the eyes. So I find that really, really fascinating. So the eye. So I just want to briefly talk about 
a couple of things which I think are really important to get your head around. So one is the, the medium through which we see, through which we can gather imagery intelligence. The other one is the vessel. So by the medium, I mean the human eye. By the vessel, I mean, it could be a human walking, but it could be a human on a horse. It could be a human in a plane. The medium could be the human eye, but it could also be telescope, binoculars, you know, other, other types of aids that can help us see further and see more. Uh, move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so talking about the medium and the vessel, for most of human history, so this is from the uh, civil war between Julius Caesar and Pompey, and you can see here horses and men, and for the vast majority of human history, this is how, the, the, this has been the, the vessel, the horse or the human being, that is the limit. So we're talking tens of miles, hundreds of miles. That's the limit. How far can a person walk? How far can a horse go? And how, how far can we see without the aid of other instruments? And next slide, please. And this goes, this goes on for millennia. So we're coming up to the 19th century here, a reconnaissance party in the wilderness in America, out using sight, trying to see what other groups of people are up to. Next slide, please. And then we get some development around the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th. We have balloons during the Civil War, so Thaddeus Lowe, the uh, intrepid. And this is from our collection on the right, the balloon section of the American Expeditionary Forces. So this was published in 1919, and it's a catalog of everything that the, the uh, balloon uh, section did in World War I. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got technological settlement for millennia. Then we have the balloon. And then in 1911, the very first aerial reconnaissance flight takes place and, the, and a war between uh, Italy and Turkey, which I won't go on to discuss any further because it would take quite a long time. So the image on the left, these are from our collection. The one on the left is from 1916. It's taken over Belgium. The one on the right is from 1917 and it's taken over France. So we can see that the, the vessel has changed from the human and the horse to the balloon, which was always kind of unstable and it wouldn't go where you wanted it to go and you know they were prone to blow up and so forth. But with the plane, that's a game changer. So we see a couple of examples here. Next slide, please. We see the, the RA, an RAF uh, plane on the left with the, with the uh, camera. So we're thinking about the vessel, but we're thinking about the medium. So cameras, telescopes, lenses, they increase our ability, our distance through which we can capture information. And on the right, this is the Italian gentleman that I was speaking about. Next slide, please. And this is from uh, World War II. So we're, we're walking the story forward, we're coming up to the Cold War. Next image, please. We're talking, uh, the, the craft is getting quite evolved by this point. So we see on the left, this is in our collection, an RAF um, photographic interpreter's toolbox, if you will. So you see on the right there, uh, stereoscope. So this is used to, basically give a 2D um, object the, the appearance of being three-dimensional. So it can really aid photographic analysis. Next slide, please. And these are the, so these are the types of things that could be used for. So you would get two images, you would overlap them, that you would use the uh, stereoscope, and then you'd be able to see um, a better rendition. Next slide, please. 
And this is from Pinamunda. So the reason I put this in is if we think about the Cold War, nuclear weapons, the Pax Atomica, the atomic peace. Part of the reasons why this comes about is rocket technology. So this is from Pinamunda. So the Royal Air Force um, trying to work out what's going on at Pinamunda, which is where the Germans were developing the V1. Uh, and then later on the V2 would come along. So this is an island in the very northeast coast of Germany. But with the Cold War coming up, it's really important to know what is the enemy up to? How many missiles do they have? Is it only one missile or is it multiple missiles packed inside one? Where are they dispersed? Are they under the ground? Are they uh, under the oceans? Are they somewhere else? So all of a sudden, the eyes become ex extremely important. Next slide, please. And then, of course, we think of the Cold War. So the Cold War, for me, when I think about the Cold War and images, I think about the Berlin airlift. I think about the Berlin Wall going up, that famous image um, of the uh, soldier <laughs> jumping over the barricade. I think of... Uh, Kennedy, I think of uh, Richard Nixon, I think of uh, Reagan standing before the Berlin Wall in 1986, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. But those are the images that the public sees and consumes. But there's a, the, during the Cold War, there was a vast apparatus gathering intelligence that didn't see uh, the light of day publicly or the, most of the time it didn't, apart from, well, there's one exception I'm going to go on to discuss. Next slide, please. Okay, so Corona, which I know Joanna is going to uh, speak about a little bit more, but that changes the game again. So just think about it. Two millennia of settlement, the horse and the eye, and then we have all of these other developments. And within the space of one human lifetime, we go from the horse the balloon, the aircraft, to the spy satellite. So all of a sudden, the scope can be, you know, I think by the end of its lifetime, Corona had mapped the entire globe. Move on to the next slide, please. That's not to say that everything was done at that kind of level. So these are from our collection. On the left here, I know Joanna's going to sp speak about this too, but the workhorse of the Cold War the Minix camera. And on the right, this is a box, a lead box, that Oleg Penkovsky used to smuggle out film from the, 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 the Minix camera um, to help the United States, the Allies, get a better understanding of what was happening during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Next slide, please. And this, I don't know if anybody knows <laughs> where this is from. This is quite a famous example. Next slide, please. So this is Adley Stevenson. So I said that quite often these images don't see light of day, but this is an example when they did. So Adley Stevenson, the US ambassador to the United Nations, goes before the United Nations and shows aerial reconnaissance imagery to make his case before uh, that body. We see this much later on with when Colin Powell goes before the UN uh, just, just before the Iraq war. Next slide, please. One thing that when I was in Germany, this was something that we still had all of these, uh, all of these film canisters from this, but the, the air corridors to Berlin were not just, you know, we associate it with the Berlin airlift and the waving kids and the candy bars, but it was also ways to gather intelligence as well, which I think is really fascinating. And I would encourage you to explore it a little bit more. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Joanna. There's a lot of ground there. Um, I think that I just wanted, as a historian, just to stress technological development and the medium and the vessel through which we can gather imagery.
Thanks, Andrew. Jana, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Andrew. I love listening to your presentation. I'm going to borrow a few of your words, if you don't mind. Love the idea of, course. of, of uh, the vessel, because I'm going to be showing a, a completely different uh, group of vessels that were used in many different ways. I want to back up to something you were mentioning, uh, to that Corona satellite program that the CIA was running. The Corona is probably uh, one of the largest camera systems that's ever been, been used, certainly the largest that's uh, been put into space at that time, it was first launched in 1959. Uh, it could photograph targets on the ground at a resolution of between 10 and 15 feet, which was phenomenal and was highly classified. The CIA never wanted back then for the, the, the resolution to be commonly known. To get those cameras uh, that are in, in these two, these two uh, slides, to get those cameras, to get the film back to Earth, they actually were dropped out of the satellite and caught in midair by um, some very brave pilots in some very uh, quick planes. Uh, Corona initially carried 8,000 feet of film in each of its cameras for a total of 16,000 feet. Um, because there were two cameras in the, in the uh, in each satellite uh, uh, canister, that's three miles of film that was in each bucket that was dropped. Um, the parachutes that would slow down the canister just long enough for the airplane to grab it with a grappling hook was something that's almost beyond my belief. Um, the men that flew those planes were called star catchers. And amazingly, they never missed one of their targets. They brought every bucket back home. The Corona program was probably one of the most classified, highly classified programs that the CIA ran back then. And it was not declassified until 1992 following Hurricane Andrew, which was a category five storm that demolished the Bahamas, Florida, and a good part of Louisiana, with Homestead Air Force Base down in Florida being ground zero. Only then was the Corona satellite data released to NPIC for the disaster relief effort. This was the first time that the American public got to see what was possible. And then later on in 1955, Vice President Gore and uh, former DCI Bob Gates released 800,000 Cold War Corona reconnaissance images for environmental research and to assess the global climate situation. So that began in 1995, which was, which was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. This is a look at the camera. Can't believe how intricate it was that they could drop it to earth and then, uh, and then reuse it. It was an amazing piece of equipment. Next slide, please. This is uh, uh, the, the uniform patch for the, uh, for the star catchers who flew the planes. Um, a piece of fabric from one of the, um, one of the um, parachutes. The artifacts are on, uh, on loan courtesy of Carol and Leonard. Next slide, please. Well, from the, from the uh, huge, from the huge size of the Corona satellite, we go to something small and warm and fuzzy, and that was CIA's pigeon cam operation. The pigeon itself was considered an intelligence collection platform um, and was targeted to photograph sensitive sites inside of the Soviet Union. In the 1970s, the program was begun and it was codenamed Takana. And it is very, very hard to find information on this program today. The Brits also had a program. They were dropping birds in a container with a parachute over occupied Europe. I believe that's on the next slide. Not sure if we've included that. Um, after um, post-war CIA took over and we were working with pigeons here in Washington DC, training them to follow lasers. We always knew the bird would come home. We wanted it to go to where the laser was. Um, the cameras for each bird cost $2,000 and weighed 35 grams. The harness itself weighed less than five grams. Those birds could take 140 pictures on a roll of film. 
we experimented in Washington, D.C., flying them over uh, what was called the Navy Yard, getting wonderfully clear photo details. Um, we thought that we were going to ship them overseas. We were hoping to be able to fly them over selected shipyards where they were building the most advanced submarines. Um, but on paper, that's where the story ends. There is no further, you cannot dig anymore. There's nothing there, <clears throat> except that my husband, Tony, had always told me years ago about a program he was part of where they were training pigeons to fly to lasers and they shipped them overseas to test them in Europe. And the end of his story about the pigeon cams is that the birds molted while they were in transit and that they arrived in London without any feathers and that that was the true end of the, uh, the program. We'll never know for sure. Next slide, please. The cameras used at CIA came in many, many sizes, many configurations. Uh, they were all, um, the, the agent cameras were all disguised in one way or another so that our, uh, our foreign assets could, to, could get close enough to the, uh, the intelligence that we were after to take clandestinely, take a picture. This is the Matchbox camera. It was um, developed by Kodak for OSS during World War II. You could, back then, uh, you could find boxes and matches anywhere. You could just remove a label and put it on, or my office would print labels for you. So you could, you could disguise them in a, in a variety of ways. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk about some of the concealed cameras that CIA used over the years during the Cold War. This is the Minox, um, the spy's favorite camera. It would uh, have been seen on screen in 67 in Casino Royale and uh, on, her, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, two of the James Bond movies that uh, kind of made this little camera a, a darling of the intelligence uh, community. The camera is so small it would fit in the palm of your hand. For nearly 40 years, this was the essential spy camera for taking secret pictures. It was created in Latvia in 1938. It had um, a very high resolution lens, a lot of flexibility, whether you were gonna conceal it in something or whether you were just gonna use it in a very covert way. It was also good for document copy. It came with a little stand. You could put it on the stand over the document there was a little chain that would uh, measure the distance to make sure you, your depth of field was what it should be. It can be concealed with a remote shutter release, but it, was, uh, it required two hands to use it. There was an opening closing motion, so you couldn't pretend to be doing something else. You were clearly taking a picture. It made a little bit of noise. It was not silent, not silent enough for us. Myself, I used it for when I went skiing in Europe. Uh, when I fell, which was often, I couldn't uh, hurt the camera and the camera couldn't hurt me. This was used until the 1990s. Uh, it had a good long run. It's a great little camera. Next slide, please. Uh, the Ticina was another uh, small camera. It was the world's smallest motor driven camera. It was 35 millimeter, could take 10 pictures before rewinding. Nice thing about the Cicina was its size. It could easily be concealed. We show it in a, in a pack of cigarettes. You could put it in many, many um, um, items. Unlike most commercially available cameras, um, the Ticina's small size and quiet operation made it easy to conceal. It was spring wound. Um, it fit readily in the modified cigarette pack, allowing you to keep it in a clandestine mode. The next slide, please. The Robot Star, this was a, work, a workhorse dated back to 1935, also spring driven, um, allowing for successive pictures without rewinding, without winding it up, used in a variety of concealments. The robot factory itself made kits to install in a variety of things. Um, the viewfinder was not necessary when using this in a, in a covert mode. It can be used in body-worn concealments. It even came with a fake attachment uh, to put it behind a button, which was very useful. We put these in waist belts, in fake pregnancy bellies on women. We put these in handbags. 
and in brief cases. It would take 50 pictures. It had good depth of field. This was a, a, a wonderfully useful camera that uh, when I was in the business, we, we used them all the time. I'm thinking of a few other concealments. We put them in bras, uh, in all kinds of clothing. We could put one in a necktie, uh, in a briefcase, in a laundry basket, in the back of a car, everywhere. This particular picture is uh, the tweed coat, is a KGB coat. The camera is, is in one of the buttons. It's actually in the button that's right above the hand in the middle picture. And he's taken the shutter actuator out of the pocket just to show you uh, what it looks like and that it goes in the pocket. But this gentleman could walk down the street coming straight at you, hand in his pocket, just ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. He could do the same thing if it was in a briefcase, ka-ching, ka-ching. Or if it was in, if he was a woman and it was in his fake pregnancy belly, ka-ching, ka-ching. You would never know that he was taking your picture until it was uh, somehow used against you. We can go to the next slide, please. This is my favorite camera. Of course, it doesn't look like a camera at all. This was called a Tropel. We used these um, only with our very best cases that we were running. This camera was so precious uh, that we didn't give them to just anyone. You had to, you had to have fabulous access to the classified documents that we were looking for before we would issue one of these. The Tropel is one sixth of the size of the Minox. The camera was closer to something made by a watchmaker than made by an optical company. The builder, and it was one man, one man in his little building behind his house. He fabricated each camera separately under large magnifying glasses and halo lights. The lens diameter was four millimeters. It held 15 inches of film. Um, and the film was not normal film. It was Kodak 1414 film, the same film that they used in the satellite program. That film was uh, precious because um, 1414 was so light. It had no weight to it and it occupied almost no space, which is how in the Corona program, how they were able to get three, four miles of film into a camera. Uh, let's see. You could take a hundred exposures. We we uh, that was called a T one hundred. We uh, eventually we backed it up to fifty exposures. That was T fifty because there was a clutch inside of that camera. The camera is the top piece in the photo. Uh, there's a camera in there. There's fifteen inches of film, uh, a clutching mechanism where you didn't have to uh, you didn't have to wind the film forward when you were working. This film, the beauty of it was that it was totally silent. It required one hand only. You could pull out your pen, your Mont Blanc pen or whatever it was. It would actually write, your pen would. If it was a big lighter, it would light your cigarette. If it was um, lipstick, you could put some on. If it was a key fob, you could jingle it in your pocket as you walked out the door to your car. It was always in an active concealment so that if somebody wanted to see you use that pen, they, they would see it. Um, your goal would be to have someone with, with this small camera, this elegant camera, next to a policymaker's desk in a foreign country. So I'm just thinking, what, Russia, China. If you had someone who could get up to the desk of the prime minister or the premier, the decision makers, with his pen, and take a couple of pictures of the agenda or the minutes after the meeting, you would have collected solid gold for America's policymakers. Uh, what did I leave out? I think I've basically covered most of it. I, don't, I didn't tell you about um, handling this in the dark room, which I did a good bit of. This is an x-ray of one of our pens that shows you, um, if you go to the, the second image, the second from the left, you can see the, the film cassette, it's the two yellow dots. The bottom dot has film around it. Uh, the, the top dot is, gonna, is the uptake. That's going to be uh, where the film goes once you start, once you start taking uh, photographs. Developing this film in a dark room 
was one of the uh, one of the scariest parts of my job when I when I worked at the CIA, because I knew that the people that had used this pen had basically risked their lives to get this information. It was very hard in the dark room. You couldn't even have safe lights on. You had to use infrared goggles where everything is green and there's no depth perception. To develop this film, you'd end up with a 15 inch piece of film with black dots on it. And each dot was an eight and a half by 11 page of intelligence. Um, you were always so double checking and triple checking yourself when you developed it, just to make sure that you couldn't screw this one up. And then the last uh, slide is, I guess it's not a slide. I said, don't do a slide. I'm just gonna hold it up to show them. Talk to you for a minute about microdots. Microdots was one of the most clandestine ways to communicate with our agents. Um, a microdot is a photograph, the smallest photograph you will ever not see. Uh, it's reducing a piece of paper down to the size of a period at the end of a sentence in a commercial magazine. And I'm holding this up. These are some American stamps. And on the back of this one stamp, we have put two microdots. And putting them on the back of a stamp was a really good place to conceal them. Mail it to your agent. He could float it off the stamp, develop it, look at it, and uh, read your questions. And I think I'm going to stop there. From the largest camera that I had anything to do with, the Corona, to the smallest photograph that I ever took. Hope you enjoyed it. Shauna Mendes and Andrew Hammond, thank you so much for those fascinating presentations. Um, I'd like to follow up with um, sort of a general question for both of you, um, but you can speak to your, your particular knowledge to answer it. I'm, I'm fascinated, in the Cold War, um, I'm kind of curious with, with the changing, changes in technology, both with cameras and with platforms, what were the challenges that people face, that operators face, that analysts face in trying to learn the best ways to use this technology? And you know, what were the types of mistakes they might have made? How do they learn from them? Um, and, and, and whether, again, whether it be the particular technologies like cameras or platforms like planes, how do they, how did people learn and address the best ways to use these platforms and technologies? I'll go first. Uh, because most of the, the cameras that I'm talking about were, were being carried around by people who were uh, working for CIA, typically betraying their, their, their country for us, risking their lives very often, taking huge chances, not just for themselves, but maybe for their families as well. Uh, it, was, it was critical that they, that they be trained in, in how to use the devices and that they uh, also be trained in, in the, uh, how to evaluate a situation, whether it was a smart thing to step forward and, and do what we were asking them to do, or maybe, maybe not. Some of the cameras were very simple, like the, the one in the button with the shutter in the, in the pocket. That was kind of a no brainer. That was really hard to mess up. Um, using something like the Tropel camera was, uh, required some extensive training because, because there was no tripod, there was no viewfinder, there was nothing except a fountain pen. And we, we would teach, our, um, we would teach our, our agent to become his own tripod. You'd do this at a desk if you could, you'd have your two elbows, you'd form a bridge, and you needed a certain distance from the, from the sheet of paper. It was about 13 and a half inches. And it was, we, we always said it was like uh, grooving your golf swing. You do it enough times and then you just kind of know, you just, you know that for me, this is the right place to take that picture. Because the chance, you, you never wanted to take the chance of someone missing the mark, risking his life for something so blurred and so fuzzy that we couldn't read it, much less act on it. I think for me, just a, a couple of quick thoughts. I think the first one would be just trial and error. Um, that's, how, you know, like just to go back to what I was saying earlier, like the vessel of the horse, like there's a long period of settlement, you know, a, a, you could have learned as much about reconnaissance from Julius Caesar as you could have from, uh, you know, Napoleon really. Um, but with these new technologies and 
the exponential rate of change. I think it's just trial and error and just constantly inching your way towards uh, success. And I think the other one, just from, you know, from my own experience, I remember one time I was tasked to take photographs of the um, members of the royal family. <laughs> and, I, and, and I remember that, well, my boss was extremely like stressed out about it. Um, I was pretty co confident. And the reason that I was confident is not because I'm cocky, but just because I had read the, the books for those cameras backwards and forwards. I had tried them under every possible condition. Um, I had backups. The backups had backups. Like there was no situation that could possibly arise that I couldn't deal with. But of course, people operating in the field didn't necessarily have the luxury of been able to carry a lot around with them. So I guess trial and error and the other one would just be preparation, testing, um, making sure everything's squared away. Great, thank you both. Um, one other broader question before we maybe focus on some of the particular technologies, we have a bunch of interesting questions in the Q&A and especially for, for you, John, and, and, and Andrew, if you can speak to this as well, I'm curious more about the organizations and how they supported the technologies and the teaching of the technologies and the development of new technologies. How, you know, how do the organizations function? Of course, don't give away anything that's classified, but I'm curious uh, from an institutional level, how these organizations functions and how they were built to support operatives and the technology they had to use. What a good question. <laughs> a good one, yeah. Well, I worked for, uh, in CIA, I worked for the Office of Technical Service, and that's exactly who we were and what we did. We provided technical support to our, to our operations officers. They were the, runs, the ones running the operations in the field. They were the ones that would come to us and say, this is what I need. Sometimes it was like that Get Smart show on TV. They'd say, you know, can you put a microphone in a shoe? We'd say, why? <laughs> um, Sometimes they come in with ideas that we, we hadn't even thought of, but once they convinced us that they needed it, really needed it, we would set about um, providing it. And if it didn't exist, we would set about inventing it. I mean, that was our only job was to support them in, in what was, um, what was a, a difficult task. So I would say my organization was probably more, more open to that kind of uh, creative engineering and there were engineers, chemists, physicists, uh, all of that. But it, it was uh, not responding to a commercial workplace. It was responding to operational requirements. It's quite a different, quite a different uh, environment. Andrew? Yeah, just, just really briefly again, um, you know, th thinking about, say, the Royal Air Force, right? The, and the 1st of April, 1918, they're the first you know, Air Force that's officially formed. But we have a, or we, sorry, we have, we had a quote in, our, uh, in one of our dark rooms. And I think it was from maybe Haig, uh, Field Marshal Haig. And he said, if I remember correctly, I hope none of you gentlemen are foolish enough to think that aircrafts can be used for reconnaissance purposes. There's only one good way to get reconnaissance, and that's by uh, the horse. So that's 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 <laughs> the opposite of what, of what Joanna's saying. So I, I think that there's cultural things as well. You know the OTS. There, it's a kind of think outside of the box kind of culture. But when you go to, you know, big army or big military, then it becomes about you know, doctrine and what's worked before. And, you know, the people that are the most senior are the people that have the most outdated technology and, you know, don't necessarily want to adjust. So I think that I just bring that up just to say that I think that culture is, is part of it as well. And, you know, that to be not that Field Marshal Haig was necessarily, you know, uh, the figure in history that comes out looking the best, but I think that to be fair, if you, I mean, you imagine you've spent your whole life in the military and it's been cavalry reconnaissance and then all of these new fangled technologies come along. I mean, it's understandable that people just fall back on what they know, but I think culture is quite interesting too. I want to add just, just a couple of things. He's you're yeah. talking about that quote. 
uh, we have some quotes of our own at Office of Technical Service. We used to say there was a, a banner hanging over our door that was written in secret ink, only we could read it. And it said, technology will always let you down. <laughs> because typically, you know, you, you get out there in the middle of a really tense situation and a battery will go, or you, you'll enter a dead zone and there's, you, there, you, there's no reception, there's no, um, uh, the other, the other uh, quote that we used a lot was that uh, desperation is the mother of invention. And we absolutely meant that. Uh, when it got right down to it, you had to come up with a solution. And we did. Awesome. I'm going to ask one, uh, hopefully a fun question before I take, we start taking questions from the audience, which is, and this is for you, Jana, based on what you just said, what was the craziest thing you, can, you ever created? Uh, in front of that you can tell us about. I I'm, I don't know that I did crazy. I did some. Oh, um, I did some. I did some pretty far out disguises. Okay. They, weren't, they weren't cameras, um, um, but I, I wasn't really doing crazy. I I, beca I became an African American woman one evening testing out some of our materials uh, in Georgetown in D.C. in the rain, and. Um, um, just, it was horrible. I couldn't go in a store and I couldn't get out of the rain and the people that were coming to get me couldn't, couldn't get there because of traffic. And I stood on the street corner and just got just drenched, ruined my red stilettos. That's my crazy story. I, I didn't do a lot of crazy. Good. I was sort of thinking was oh, this crazy, uh, weirdest thing that, you know, you were asked to ever build that you know, when you never would have thought of. We did, we did a lot of uh, saying, saying no, actually. People, okay, fair people enough. That wanted, people that wanted to be amused by our gadgets, and this, this goes back to disguise again. I was the chief of disguise. People that wanted to use, very high level people that wanted us to use the disguises to get a, to get a joke, to get a laugh at a, <laughs> I don't know what a thing. And we, we were just not fun people. We said no. For you. What I'd like to do is maybe start to take some questions from the audience. I'll start out that there are a number of questions of people fascinated by the pigeons and the pigeon cameras. So, so anything you want to say more about that, I'm sure a lot of people would appreciate. Um, in, in, in the first iteration of the International Spy Museum, we had a little room with a glass box in the middle. There was a pigeon in it. I believe it was a British pigeon and it had been given a medal uh, by, by the British military for something that it did. And the floor of that room was an was a, a, a overhead photography. It was a picture of the Neuschwanstein castle in Bavaria. Ooh. And this whole thing was just kind of, kind of vague. The pigeon thing gets vague whenever you start trying to push in on it. But, but this, this pigeon was a, was, was a hero. And uh, I don't know where that pigeon lies today, but I think we should dust it off and pull it out and celebrate it uh, if there's this much interest in, in pigeons. Great. Um, I'm also seeing a, poll, a bunch of questions about the cameras. How noisy were they? Did, did, were, did people get, were people put in danger because of the limitations of the cameras and they were noisier, they could be seen? Also, uh, Johnny, did you have previous experience with photography before you joined the CIA? Um, anything you want to speak to there? I think with the, um, a lot of people would be interested in hearing. I was an avid um, um, amateur photographer. And I was actually on my way out the door at CIA. I was going to go find a really interesting job because I had some administrative job that I thought was just boring. And it was. And they said, well, why don't you take some of our photo courses? And, and that's how I really started stepping into photography and becoming a technical operations officer. It was it was kind of luck. I was always interested in photography. Um, it, I didn't know it was going to be my calling, but um, the office was was very generous with the with the offer to uh, to train me. I mean, this is over years, and and then I ended up training um, a lot of people around the world. That's what the job was on how to use these these small, uh, intricate, delicate, really good cameras. Uh, and how to do it in a way that they wouldn't get arrested. And if they're in Moscow, executed, because that's what happened in Moscow, they would, they would kill you. So the fact whether the cameras made noise really mattered. 
whether you could really conceal one, seriously conceal it really mattered. If you were caught with one of these cameras, um, you were gonna be you were gonna be in terrible trouble. But those small ones that really would allow you to get up to just, I keep thinking, gee, if we had someone in, in Putin's office, I mean, maybe we do, I don't know. But if we did, and, and he had one of our Montblanc pens and was just standing there at the desk by the inbox, you know, with his pen, just making a note, maybe we could figure out what's gonna happen next. Did agents, operatives, did, get, did they get into trouble? With, how frequently might they have gotten into trouble? Was it something that was rare because of the cameras or was it something that changed over time as you improved the technology? I know there was one, uh, one, one Russian working in his embassy, I believe his name, Motorin, that was his, that was his case name, not, that was his pseudonym. Um, he lost his camera. His camera, I think was in a key fob and he left it somewhere and it was found. And he ended up being called back to Russia and he's never been seen again. Without a doubt, he was, he was executed. That's true. So, you know, you had to, you had, you, it, it was life and death. You had to be very careful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions that are more comparative in terms of how did our cameras, our technology compare to other countries? To which countries have maybe as equivalent or better te uh, technology compared to us? How do we compare to the Soviets? And again, for both, for both of you, if you want to weigh in. Andrew, take it. Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, the Corona is a good example, like the, like Sputnik, you know, the, the truism as it launched the space race, but it was a more of a, a, a test that turned out to be a propaganda coup, whereas Corona was the, I believe, the world's first uh, spy satellite reconnaissance satellite and it was built for that purpose so i mean through the through the cold war just to go to that specifically you always see this challenge and response dynamic and even if even if the soviets weren't necessarily doing the r d that was happening in the united states then they would just get people to try to steal it for them um, and i mean we even see that happening today right with lots of intellectual property and so forth but um i think that there's a, a a challenge and response dynamic that that goes on through the cold war period which you know we could discuss at greater length but yeah i'll, I'll hand it over to uh, jana for some maybe a specific example well with our small cameras um especially a camera like the tropel the one in the pen eventually one of them would be captured it would be it would be compromised and uh, whoever, let's, call, let's say the Russians, because they make such great bad guys. So the Russians would look at our small camera and they would say, you know, we could build that uh, and we could improve it. We could put a headlight on it or, or, or whatever. So they would, they would take our technology, rerun it through their, their uh, engineers. And then eventually we would capture one of theirs. There was a lot of this that went on. They had a camera, it was a rollover camera. It was literally uh, like the spine of a book and you just roll it over the piece of paper and you would photograph line by line the whole piece of paper. So we got one of theirs and we thought, well, that's, that's useful. That's very cool. And we thought it was a little, a little uh, 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 unsophisticated. So we made it more sophisticated and then they caught ours and then they saw that their errors and the technology would bump back and forth. I, I would tell you one quick story. Tony and I were having, my husband and I were having drinks in Georgetown with um, a man who's connected to the museum and with a Russian who was our counterpart uh, back in the day. He was our mirror image and he had brought us a Matryoshka doll and he wanted to have a drink with us and we're, we didn't really, we couldn't think of anything to say to him and he clearly really couldn't think of anything to say to us. So it was kind of a silent table and um, he and his, his, uh, our friend, they were getting ready to leave. And the Russian turns to Tony and he says, just this. He says, Tony, he says this in English. He didn't speak English, but he said this in English. Tony, he said, that Xerox machine, fabulous. And walked out the door and my husband's sitting there. You see, <laughs> they found it. 
oh, what does that mean? I mean, it just, it just, Tony never really got over that, but that was part of this back and forth. Always oh. interesting. Just, just really briefly, just one example that came to mind on this. Um, you know, uh, here at the museum as well, we have a copy of the Great Seal of the United States that was in the Soviet embassy, and it was gifted to the US ambassador by Soviet school children. And a, um, a, a listening device was in there, and, and Peter Wright, an MI5, the MI5's first technical uh, intelligence officer was, you know, they were baffled by this, but after a couple of months, he discovered the principles that were behind it, and then he immediately set out to make it for, like, the British. So I think the culture could be a part of it, but no one side has a monopoly on good ideas. That's true. Awesome. Um, I have two other questions I'll pose to you since we're getting to the end of the hour. One is, uh, we have some interest in underwater cameras. And how often have those been used? And were they easier? And did they work? I have no knowledge of underwater really? cameras. I'm okay. sure they were there. Okay. I could see where there would be a value to them, but they were not in my purview okay. at all. Okay, fair enough. Sorry. No, that's good. Andrew, do you have anything to say on that? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, I've used them before and stuff, but um, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Think, think of the Glomar Explorer, Andrew. They must have had. We know. We know they had underwater cameras when they were going down trying to lift that Russian sub off the ocean floor. Yeah, I mean, I find the Cold War that took place beneath them is really, really fascinating, and it and it goes all over the globe. Um, and submarines, just by their very nature, are great platforms for capturing intelligence, right? Um, but I mean, one thing, just since we're almost out of time, I did want to try to squeeze in was uh, today in the newspaper, uh, it was talking about uh, drone footage of a Ukrainian attack on our, the Russian convoy. And I think it's about an hour, a, a minute and 40 seconds long. And Bellingcat using, you know, their open source um, abracadabra, um, you know, ways and means managed to locate where it was. So I think that that's another thing that we haven't discussed, which is important. We've got the vessel, we've got the medium, but then how do we make sense out of all of this? And sure, there is a proliferation of information, but then there's also people like Bellingcat that can work out who the GRU people were that tried to poison, uh, you know, a, a, a Russian dissident in London and so forth. So I just wanted to get that in because that's another interesting dynamic, drones picking up information. Well, actually, that kind of relates to the last question I was going to throw to both of you, which is, you know, looking forward, looking to today, actually. You know, now that we have, there's so much information out there, so much imagery, what is um, our capacity to handle it? Um, I have one question here, it's saying that's asking, despite the advancements in machine learning, have we outstripped our human ability to collect and assess image intelligence? You know, I think it's the same problem that NSA has been dealing with over the years uh, in, 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 in their, their, uh, with their ears. They receive so much, it's like an avalanche every day, the door opens and the sound pours down on them and they have to find the significant pieces of that sound. They have to find a way through it. I think the same thing probably applies to imagery, that you have to be selective. You have to be able to cut through voluminous uh, 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 images and know what, you're, know what you're looking for, or you'd just be lost. I, th I, th I think, you know, I think that it does come with a lot of challenges, but, you know, the challenge and response dynamic that I spoke about, then there's just even more powerful ways of harnessing the information or mining the information. And even if you think about us as a vessel for collecting intelligence, or let's just say information, if we took in every piece of phenomena each of us encountered every day, like every piece of information that was around us, every visual cue and piece of stimuli, we would be overwhelmed. But we deal with it because we focus on certain things, we only 
bring in certain parts of information and so forth. So if you want to think about something like the NSA as a as a as an organism, you know, it doesn't if it's if its strategy is just to drink in everything everybody produces everywhere, then that's one thing. But if you're focusing it on particular areas, then there there are ways to try to deal with that. And there's always new technological developments, but yeah, as a big a big problem. Great. Thank you both, Joanna Mendez and Dr. Andrew Hammond, for a vibrant and fascinating discussion. And thank you to everyone who logged into our discussion this evening. Uh, there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A about how you can see this again. And I'll repeat that uh, this, should be, this program should be available on the Spy Museum YouTube channel and perhaps the website as well. Um, and just to let everyone know, both the International Spy Museum and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library are open to the public and are hosting a number of exciting programs this spring. March 31 and April 1, the Pritzker Museum will have our annual on-war symposium, featuring the most recent recipient of the Pritzker Lifetime Literary Achievement Award, Dr. Margaret McMillan. Uh, this event will be held in person, but for the, it will also be live streamed for people who cannot travel to Chicago. For information on this and other events this spring, visit our website at pritzkermilitary.org. Uh, in addition to its exhibits in its Washington DC location, the International Spy Museum is hosting virtual programs practically every week. You can see a schedule of upcoming pro events at spymuseum.org. I'll just quickly plug the panel I'll be hosting at the end of April, April 27, Berlin, the Cold War Capital Spies with Bernd von Costa and Dr. Alexis Albion. So thank you all again, once again, and have a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you.